What's up, everybody? I hope you guys are all doing well today, and I would like to say thank you for stopping by and checking out the channel. So, there's a few reasons why you clicked here on my video today. If you're thinking about trying out Tiny Tunis Wonderlands, trying to decide if whether or not the game may be worth your time and money, especially if you don't normally play looter shooters, or you've already started and you don't have much of an idea on what to do. That's why I come in. Now, by the time you see this video, it's going to be either very close to release or during the release of the game. And my mission here today is to try and help smooth some things over for you guys so you can enjoy it just as much as I have. So the first section that we have here will be loot options. Now, when you first start the game, you're going to have two options to pick from regarding how loot will be distributed for you throughout the game. Cooperation and competition. Now, the first option, which is cooperation, that enables everyone to find their own loot, promising gear for yourself in every single encounter. What you find is yours and yours alone. Now, the next option is for those who are more on the brave side, right? Who would playing with others in a group. And that would be competition, which means everyone gets access to the exact same loot pool. So, for example, whenever you kill a boss or an enemy, everybody will see the same loot and layman's terms that means movie feet or lose your seat but there is always the option to trade with somebody else in case there's something that you really wanted like a legendary sword that did lightning damage or a smg that did frost damage so to say now we're going to go ahead and move on to the next section which is about which class should you pick so whenever you boot up a new game for wonderlands you're going to have to pick a class before you can actually start playing you'll have the option to pick in between six classes which includes Berserkers, Clawbringers, Grave Warren, Spell Shot, Spar Warden, and Stabamancer. And each class has their perks that can benefit their playstyles in many different ways. Now, Berserkers focus lies in the area of dealing damage by way of melee and frost status effect. Its main abilities are Rage of the Ancients, as its class feat, and Dreadwind and Feral Surge, as its action skills. And for its passives, they can range from increasing move speed to regenerating health to gaining a bonus damage increase based off how close you are to an enemy. So this class definitely benefits off of just continuously being in the face of whoever it is that you're fighting. Now the next class will be Clawbringer and their ability to deal damage through the use of fire and lightning based attacks while also having a pet wyvern to hang out and help you deal with enemies which is actually their class feat and its action skills are, are called cleansing flames and storm dragon's judgment and now if you're a fan of builds that deal with heavy status effect damage then i definitely suggest that you give this one a try and its passes can range from doing bonus fire and lightning damage to increasing the elements of damage for themselves and all allies or even saving yourself from entering a revive state which in this game is called save your soul now next up is graveborn your usual high risk high reward class right now the area of expertise lies in kill skills spells and dark magic using their demi lich companion and sacrificial action skills to enact suffering upon their enemies even at the cost of their own life force now any spell cast by the graveborn will cause the demi lich to cast a unique spell of their own as well as triggering kill skills to unleash hellish minions now the demi lich is their class feat that attacks enemies from range and also does dark magic its action skills are called dire sacrifice and repair of bones with its passive skills ranging from spell cooldown rates to regaining health every time they use a spell to sacrificing your companion whenever you reach one health to refill your health now next up is spell shot right and this class is all about taking guns and magic to the to the next level it's about being able to swap back and forth between ammo in the arcane arts increasing your spell damage and fire rate so whenever you got to reload you got to spit fire spell ready to go locked and loaded and vice versa and spells and wonderlands take the place of your usual grenades that you will see in other games and everyone has access to spells so you don't have to worry about it being class specific on that front now the class feet for spell shot is called spell weaving now whenever you cast a spell or you reload your weapon it grants you a stack of spell weaving which increases spell damage now spell weaving stacks automatically decay after a few seconds and casting the repeating spell has a chance to award additional spell weaving stacks with each repeating cast so this skill should constantly be activating every single time you enter a fight its action skills are called polymorph and ambihextrous and its passive skills can range from increased reload speed to increased fire rate for every spell spell rate every spell weaving stack and having your guns deal bonus element damage based off the last spell that you cast it 
Next up is Spore Warden for all of my bow and arrow fans out there in the world. This class has a heavy focus on gun and companion abilities, powering up your companions to jump into the fight while you provide some heavy hard hitting backup. Now his class feed is a mushroom companion that targets nearby enemies and deals with poison damage. Pinging an enemy will cause your mushroom companion to launch towards them, and any increases to the fate maker's damage, which is you will also apply to your companions so every damage buff that you get they can share now their class skills are called barrage and blizzard and their passive skills can range from increasing your companion's health and damage to increasing your gun damage and handling and giving your companion the ability to let one rip and fart poison clouds that deal damage over time last but not least stab master the class i know everybody is Everybody, everybody that I know too is personally excited for it. Critical hits and status effects are where this class can truly shine, using everything they have to attack with and keep on building with the critical hits. They're somewhat fragile, but once you get the hang of it, your enemies shouldn't really be able to touch you. Now, their class feat is called Dirty Fighting. Their critical, and that what that means is their critical hit chance is increased, and its action skills are called Ghost Blade and From the Shadows. Their passive skills can range from increasing melee, spell, and gun damage all at once to a damage bonus that gets greater the faster you're moving and making your next melee hit a promised critical hit for a short duration. Now, the very cool thing about these classes is that once you progress far enough into the game, you will have the ability to turn your build into a dual class build. For example, you could combine a Spore Warden and a Spell Shot to make a Sporcerer, which is the build that you, you're currently seeing me play with. And Sporcerer, you'll, you, uh, that's the new name, right? So whenever you mix two builds together, you'll get a new name for that combined class. And in terms of your skills and whatnot, right? Remember, you have three sections. You have your class feet, your action skills and your passive skills. The way your action skills work, you're only able, you're only allowed to have one of them active at a time. And once you make a dual class build, the total number of action skills that you will have will go up from two to four. But the same rules still apply if you only being able to have one active at a time. But in terms of the class feats and the passive skills, you're going to have full access to both of them. So, for example, let's say if you decided to pick a Clawbringer and a Graveborn, you're still only going to be able to pick one action skill, but you will have access to all of your passives and you'll have two companions following you around. Right. You'll have a demon and a dragon following you around. That's how like that's how that works. Now, once you get further into creating your character, you're going to come across a section which is called Twist of Fate, which lets you pick your character's background. Now, the thing here is whichever background you pick, that's going to have an impact on your base stats. You can pick whichever background you want, but if you want to get the absolute most out of it, be sure to pick a background that matches your class. For example, if you were to pick Stabamancer with their increased critical hit chance the village idiot or raised by elves would be the best pick because they provide the biggest boost the crit chance or crit damage or let's say if you wanted to pick graveborn again the class that sacrifices itself to deal dark magic ability damage failed monk would be the best background for you because you get pluses on both spell cooldowns and status damage and it leaves your base health stat untouched and don't worry because you will be able to upgrade your hero stats as you progress into the game our next section uh lies around navigating and understanding the menus so the biggest map will be the overworld by far which is loaded with quests loot chance encounters with enemies and more now there are large areas that you'll be able to explore such as Mount Coral, Shadow Grave, Barrow, War 2, Shallows, and more. Now in reality, the entire map is the game board that Tina and the others are playing on, but you'll be seeing it from the perspective of a mini character that's traveling around the map. So think like Toy Story or Toy Soldiers if you've ever seen any of those old animated movies, right? And when we go over a page, now we're looking at your journal. So your journal is where you'll keep track of your quests, world buffs, shrines, and more. Quests, pretty much self-explanatory. Shrines, however, these are things that you will find in the overworld that are incomplete. And you're, and you're gonna have to search the region, you know, the surrounding area in the overworld for the missing pieces. Once you do, then you find all of the pieces to fully put it back together, you'll end up getting a shrine a permanent shrine buff like for example 10 percent gold gain plus 10 percent gold gain and then below that you have challenge buffs which you only get from completing campaign challenges like for example finding lucky dice which are these black and gold glowing floating dice 
that you will find in many areas inside of the overworld and the challenge buffs that you can get when you complete the when you complete them they can range from things like plus 20 percent loop luck or plus 10 percent strength right so there's more than enough incentive to actually go and get those things done now your inventory is where you'll find things like your guns and your spells and etc as you progress through the story additional slots in your inventory will unlock granting you the ability to hold four weapons and two rings at once your skill section is where you will find your class feats, your action and passive skills, and your hero stats all in one. Myth rank is something that you shouldn't be worrying about until you get to end game, which is level 40. So, well, eh, end game is not level 40. You get end game once you complete the base campaign, but you don't get myth rank until you hit level 40. So don't don't worry about that. Just put that on the back burner for now. Next up would be items in the world. So there will be loot chests everywhere you go. And I do mean everywhere. In both the overworld and the areas inside it. Now these chests drop everything from health to ammo to weapons and money. Whenever so whenever you're looking for new stuff, these boxes will be your best friends now there are three kinds of chests right you have your standard loot chest which houses all of the common things you'll need ammo help and such and it will look like anything from a safe to a mini fridge to a lock box you got it now after that we have the second one which is the white chest which will drop you which will primarily only drop weapons and spells those are the only things you will find in those chests after that, we have the biggest of the three, which are the red chest because of the wet of the red padding interior inside that holds some of the more premium sweet, sweet loot, right? Keep this in mind. The red chests are normally hidden in hard to find places or behind simple puzzles that you come across in the world. But there are some that you can just walk up on and see immediately, like out of 90% of all red chests in the game. 10% of them you will easily just be able to walk up on and find no problem also because this is important all loot chests that you see will be marked by a green light so you know what to look for next up are the, are the vending machines and you'll always find them in sets of three at key points around whatever area you're in next to a fast travel station now the weapon store will sell you ranged and melee weapons also ammo the ammo store will sell you armor and shields which are called wards in this game and in the magic shop you can buy spells rings and amulets to equip now each shop also has an item of the day that refreshes every 20 minutes in case you're looking for something to get but in my honest opinion outside of stocking up on ammo and health and occasionally selling whatever loot you picked up that you don't want or don't need anymore you don't really need to buy you don't really need to be going into these vending machines for nothing else early game especially because let's say for example you buy a weapon that costs twenty seven thousand, and you buy a weapon that costs twenty seven thousand, and you have 29 you go and complete a quest the very next quest you end up getting the weapon that's 30 levels higher so you just wasted twenty seven thousand gold for nothing don't don't do that <laughs> don't do that don't be like me save your money early game then once you get later on you got some more money in your pocket i would say that you're safe to buy anything that may or may not catch your eye now we're going to move over to locations and key stations so throughout your journey in the wonderlands you're going to come across many different locations each with their own gimmicks but the most important one will be your home away from home which is bright hoof bright hoof is where you can get various things done while you continue your journey I like stopping at the blacksmith for storage deck upgrades so you can increase the max ammo capacity on your guns and the item storage capacity for your backpack lawsuit machine and player bank and on the other side of the shop you also have a area where you can go and respect your weapons right so if you want to respect a gun with cryo damage or a gun with fire damage or whatever or an armor piece so be it this is where you can go to reroll your stats and in order to reroll your stats you're gonna have to pay with a currency which is called 
moon orbs now the moon orbs on a reroll station you won't really see or come across until you complete the base campaign and you get into the end game with uh chaos chambers and everything so i would say don't worry about it necessarily right now but yes just so you know you can definitely reroll the stats and stuff on your gear and this is where you go to get it done now next up is the quick chain station player bank and lost loot machine now all three of these can be found inside of izzy's fizzies right next to the chestnut gate now the quick chain station right this allows you to mess with your appearance the way your armor looks your emotes your banner and more it's also where you can go to respect your skills and hero points if there's anything that you want to you know mix up and in case you want to try out something new now next up is the player bank where you can put away items in storage whenever you don't want to hold it or you don't have any more space and the great thing about the bank is that no matter which character you're on all of your characters will be able to access anything you put in the bank so let's say if you put in a legendary sword on a berserk uh, while you're playing with a berserker and then you go back into the bank on a spell shot they can pick up that same sword nice and easy let me squeeze next and last is the law is the lost loot machine which collects loot items that were not picked up and saves them for you to grab later and again keep this in mind this does have this does they all do have a storage limit which is why you would go to the blacksmith to upgrade this it won't pick up every single piece of loot that you've forgotten it will only pick up every piece until it's full after that whatever you missed you missed that's just how it is now if you were to drop any items that you already had in your inventory or items that you picked up and then dropped the machine won't touch them because then at that point they're considered abandoned so if you see loot and you don't grab it don't worry the machine will get it for you as long as there's still space in the machine now we move over to quest icons which ranges from talking to an npc with the icon over their head or just simply walking up to a bounty board and taking a bounty now if you're somebody who loves doing side missions and likes to take them and likes to take their time with the game then you have nothing to worry about because besides exploring you'll, you'll have plenty of things to do there's bounties and npcs not even just in bright hoof all over the wonderlands all over the overworld trust me it'll be everywhere that you go and last but not least the skeleton chest so the skeleton chest is where you're gonna get the top of the line loot right now you're gonna get top of the line loot period like once you get in the end game but there are but the skeleton chest is pretty much like a guarantee premium extra premium item so to say and the only way to open this chest is with a skeleton key now the keys are only given out on social media through uh accounts like randy pitchfork they give out a bunch all the time they still give them out for, uh, for some of the older games like borderlands 3 sometimes and they also tend to hide them in trailers and already post them on socials right so if you keep up with wonderlands on social media make sure to take like a closer look at everything it is that they post because you could be looking at a random picture and next thing you know in the top right hand corner there's a code there's a skeleton there, there's a code to give you a skeleton key and you can use that to get something out of that chest now with all of that being said that brings us to the end of the video uh this was definitely more outside my comfort zone because i don't really do beginners guys like this but i'm trying to get more out of my comfort zone and doing things that i would normally do so let me know down in the comments below uh if i managed to help out any of you guys if the advice was solid uh let me know if let me know what builds you guys are planning to make i'm pretty sure uh you yes you i'm talking to right now five out of 10 people that watch this video you're probably gonna be number one you're gonna pick stab a master i know just let me know what bills y'all pick and how y'all liking them because i'm curious to see what y'all thoughts are and make sure to like share and subscribe and hit that notifications bell so you'll never miss out on any of my future content especially my wonderlands related content and i will catch you guys in the moonlight peace